point uh, for our study tonight. Psalm 119, maybe one of the most well-known psalms. Psalm 119, look at verse number one. This, of course, is the writer speaking much about the Word of God itself, about the Bible. And he uses different words to say or to, to talk about the Scripture. He uses, for example, verse 1, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. That term or phrase, law of the Lord, is referring back to God's Word. Blessed are they that keep His, here's another one, keep His testimonies, and that seek Him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy, here's another word, precepts diligently. And so the the psalmist says in verse 5, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy, another word, commandments, statutes, again, verse number 5. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy, another phrase, righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. O oh, forsake me not utterly. And then verse 9, and we won't read the whole thing obviously, but just uh, good verses, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. I think that's a good, a good set of statements to, to begin with. And then he goes on, by the way, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter, if you want to call it that, in all of the Bible. Anybody without looking know how many verses there are? 176. You're a cheater probably. But uh, 176, 176 verses. I didn't mean to call you a cheater, but Tyler, that's good. Good knowledge. 176 verses in, in Psalm 119. And just about every single one of them is, again, speaking about God's word, God, God's precepts, God's law, and his desire to do those things. And I think that's a, a good thing uh, to, to study and to, to look at. Let's pray and we'll kind of get in. Lord, we've prayed um, several times tonight, and we don't want to make it just something that we do. Uh, I need your help. I, I need your help to, to teach through this and, and to work our way through this. And so please... Help me, Lord, uh, tonight, and I pray that you'd help these, your people, to have a love for your word and to understand what is found in it, and Lord, that it would be profitable, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, on your outline there, we'll just kind of get into the study. Psalms is, uh, its theme is, for the most part, these are kind of overall themes, worship and praise, all right? And we see that through much of the Psalms. Some of them are not uh, worship and praise. Some of them are, are different in their theme, in their scope. But uh, for the most part, the theme of the book is worship and praise. Psalm is the longest book in the Bible. And again, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter. Now, I'll say that to say, when you say Psalm, turn to Psalm, you don't say chapters, it's turn to Psalm, whatever. Psalm 119, Psalm 40, Psalm 57. They're not necessarily designated as chapters. They are separate psalms. Um, Many have called them songs. In fact, uh, if you look at the end of Psalm 119, Psalm 120 is is a song of degrees. Many of these were used as a psalter, as a songbook for the the, the people of Israel. Now, when we think of uh, hymnal, you know, we think of like, you know, this. It's, you know, turn to hymn 366. Well, that's not how they did it when they were singing these, these songs or these psalms. They would memorize these psalms, separate psalms, and they would sing them uh, out in praise, and they would use that to hide God's word in their heart so they might not sin against the Lord. All right? Uh, different activities, different feasts and festivals. As they're making their way up the steps to the, in the temple, as they're going up to worship, they would sing several of these, these psalms. In fact, the Song of Degrees is as they're making their way toward the temple to worship, they're singing these songs of degrees. Just a little bit of, of uh, helpful trivia or knowledge for you, all right? Um, Psalms. Many of us, anybody's favorite book is Psalms? I love Psalms. It's one of my favorite books. I, I absolutely love Psalms. And what we said when we kind of turned that corner with Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon is these are now books of poetry, there is some history in some of these books. 
my microphone on? It's on mute. There we go, Brother Jose. Sorry. All right, now you can hear me. So some of these have history in them. In fact, we'll look at that uh, here in just a little bit. Uh, some of the Psalms have uh, actual events that took place and uh, what happened as a result of those events, how God worked in the life of Israel and in the lives of some of Israel's enemies and, and how he worked in, in different circumstances. But much of Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon is very uh, emotional. There's, we, we get to kind of have an um, inside view of the heart of the people who wrote these books and we get to have a, a kind of a front row seat, if you will, to their relationship with the Lord. We don't always get that in some of the history books. We see a lot of what happened and how God worked and moved and then disobedience and then obedience and then disobedience again. We get to see some of the facts. But specifically, like in the book of Psalms, is great because we get to see what they're thinking and feeling on the inside. And oftentimes when people are struggling or grieving or frustrated or even when they're, they're uh, enjoying life or happy or full of joy, uh, they will turn to the Psalms and get great encouragement from these Psalms because they just they, they seem to connect better than most books do. There's a lot of mourning in Psalms. There's a lot of emotion expressed in the book of Psalms. And there's some division here that uh, will help. There's your themes. Worship and praise is kind of the first thought on your outline there. Now, division one. In fact, take your Bible to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. And I want you to see what I'm talking about here when we, we make these divisions, all right? When you get to Psalm 1 in my Bible, right before Psalm 1, it says Book 1. All right, if you maybe have a study Bible or some Bible that, that gives you some divisions of paragraphs or, or themes in your Bible, kind of some outline there, it will just say Book 1, and that is Psalm 1 through Psalm 41. All right, that's Book 1. And on your outline, I think I gave you some space just to kind of write some things down if you're interested in this or if it will be a help to you. Most of book one was written by David. All right? Most of the, the Psalms in, in book one are written by David. And the general theme then in book one is fallen man being blessed by a loving God. All right? Fallen man being blessed by a loving God. Some of the Psalms, for example, Psalm 22, some of them are prophetic. Psalm 22 is a tremendous um, prophetic passage of Scripture because it, it describes the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ hundreds of years before crucifixion was even a, a mode of, of <laughs> killing someone, of taking someone's life. It describes, in, in fact, in great detail what happened on the cross of Calvary in the New Testament, that is a, a prophetic passage, Psalm 22, a wonderful prophetic passage. Uh, and, and just it's amazing how God gives His people, and, and to us as well, gives His people some of these, these, these books, these, these chapters, these psalms. Some of the psalms in, in book one are prayers of deliverance. Um, David would oftentimes pray. In fact, um, when you read Psalm 3 and Psalm 4 and Psalm 5. Those psalms tie together. David in Psalm 3 is rising up for a brand new day and he's asking for the Lord's help and wisdom and protection because specifically in Psalm 3, he's fleeing from his son Absalom. You remember who stages this coup and, and attempts to take over the, the, the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Judah, uh, the nation of Israel at that time. And he, what does David do? He doesn't even fight back. He just gets his stuff and rides out of town. Well, Psalm 3 is him rising up and asking for God's protection. Psalm 4 is him laying down at night and asking again, Lord, would you protect me through the night? And then Psalm 5 is him rising again the next day, if you will, and again asking God for a brand new day and brand new protection for that day. And it's just amazing as you read through some of those how, how we see, again, the struggles that David was having and, and how he prayed and how he got a hold of God and how we ought to do the exact same thing. How I ought to be praying daily and nightly for, for many of these things that, that David is praying for. Um, then on your outline, and I believe it's now on the screen, Psalm 42 through Psalm 72 makes up book two. And if you want, you can turn to Psalm 42. We won't read that, but you can see in your Bible it'll say just book two. That's the second separation group of Psalms. Again, mostly written by David. 
Some of these in book two were written by the sons of Korah. Now, if you remember the sons of Korah, um, there's kind of two lines that, that are at play here. Israel is in the wilderness and they're wandering around and the sons of Korah get together and uh, you remember the, the um, sons of Levi were those who were supposed to take care of the tabernacle. Different uh, groups, different tribes in there had uh, different responsibilities in the tabernacle. Some were to take care of um, the, the cord and the coverings and the, the pieces of the tabernacle. Some were to take care of the, the, uh, the instruments and all that. Well, the sons of, of, of uh, uh, Korah were part of that group, the, the Kohathites that took care of the things that really couldn't be touched by hands. The other stuff you could carry on carts, but the stuff for the sons of, of uh, Korah, you had to cover up and then you had to take by hand. And they began to struggle with some of those things. And they got tired, honestly, of carrying the stuff by hand. And so the Bible describes for us in the Old Testament how the sons of Korah rose up against Moses and against Aaron, believing that they wanted to be part of the priesthood and not part of the ones who just carry the stuff, so to speak. And so it's, tri it's a very dramatic passage of Scripture. Moses calls them out forward and demands that they burn incense. And then he, he says this statement, and he's really praying to the Lord, and he says, okay, if, if I'm the one who's doing wrong, then the Lord take my life. But if these sons of Korah are the ones who are doing wrong, then let the earth split open and swallow them up. As soon as he gets done praying that prayer or saying that statement, you know what happens? The earth splits and swallows them up. It's amazing. I mean, you ever know anybody you want to pray that prayer for? Yeah, a um, couple of them. <laughs> but these sons of Korah who write some of these psalms, what most seem to, to think is that they are the younger offspring of some of those men who were swallowed up, who did not, uh, they didn't either follow in their father's footsteps or they were too young to know why they were rebelling. And so they joined back in with where they were supposed to be in their responsibilities. And what happens when David takes the throne is the sons of Korah then become the song leaders for the nation of Israel. And so the, in, in book two, those that are listed as the, the songs of the, the son, written by the sons of Korah, those were tremendous songs that Israel would sing as they worshipped their God. Right? Some of those uh, psalms in this book too, Psalm 42 through Psalm 72, uh, a lot of them are parallels of Israel's um, downfall and then some of their redemption. They, they would be defeated and then they would, would come back and God would fight battles for them. And some of them are historical accounts and you read how they were in, in dire straits, in, in, in serious trouble, and then they prayed to God and God delivered them, and then the song was written, the psalm was written as a praise to God. And so what they would do is, is use these songs to remind them and then generations to come who would sing these songs also of their history and how God had helped them time after time after time. How if they would turn to God, God would help and deliver and give strength. That's book two in, in your divisions of psalm. Now, next, book three. That's Psalm 73 through Psalm 89. Most of these in, in book three were written by a man named Asaph. Asaph. And there is, um, Asaph was again one of the song leaders in Israel. One of the great song writers of Israel during this time. Asaph, and then there's also some family members of Asaph that get in on a, on a few of these psalms. God uses them to write some of these songs, some of these, these psalms. They focus on God's power. They focus on God's holiness and His ability to greatly deliver. Um, we're going to turn to one in here in just a little bit, but uh, Psalm 73 and Psalm 77 are tremendous. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to jump ahead of myself, but just plan for it. We're going to be turned to Psalm 73 in just a, a little bit. All right, book four. Book four is Psalm 90 to Psalm 106. Most of these in that section are unknown who wrote them. It just says a psalm, right? Or some don't even have a, a, a superscription above them. Unknown authors for the most part. Now, Psalm 90, do you know who wrote Psalm 90? Anybody know that? 
Moses wrote Psalm 90. All right? The Bible declares it's a prayer of Moses. All right? So he's writing this song praising the Lord. By the way, Moses in Psalm 90, that's where uh, he is imploring God's help to number our days. Right? Because we need to imply or give our hearts to wisdom. Right? If you remember that, that statement or that phrase, that, that happens in book number four. Most, most of book number four is about Israel's relation. How does Israel relate to other nations around them? Uh, what is going on around the nation of Israel and how are they interacting with those, those other nations? And how is God using Israel? And then what is God doing among those other nations also? Right? How is God delivering Israel? How is God helping Israel? them to defeat the enemies around them and then again what is going on why why are they enemies of Israel because they're worshiping false idols they're they're going against God they're the enemy of the Lord that's found in book four all right book five book five is Psalm 107 it's kind of the largest uh, split up here book book five Psalm 107 to Psalm 150 and again most of those are written by David we read some of Psalm 119. Most of those books focus on God's Word, on praising the Lord. There's much in those books about thanksgiving that we ought to offer to the Lord. And so just some tremendous passages in that, that final book, Psalm 107 to Psalm 150. All right, so there's your breakdown. So when you see those books, there's kind of, you kind of get in your mind, okay, here's kind of the emphasis or the thoughts, and who's, here's who wrote most of these psalms, all right? Now, what I wanted to do is try to, because there's just so much in psalm to kind of go through, I wanted to try to make it uh, practical and applicable. And so I, I've read most of this and, and borrowed from other people, but I, I wanted to pass it along to you. Um, so I, I believe I included this, six reasons why psalms is practical today. Right? Why should we be involved with psalms today? I mean, if it's just a bunch of songs and, you know, history of Israel and those kind of things, why should we do that? Well, there's some great reasons, all right? Number one, the psalms really are like a mini Bible, like the Bible in miniature, if you will. The book of Isaiah is similar in that, in fact, Isaiah has 66 chapters. The book is 66 chapters long. The Bible has 66 books, but this also is a, a Bible in miniature. Because what it, the book of Psalms does is it gives the, the entirety, if you will, the history of Israel, and I would say the entirety of the history of salvation. We, we see parts in the book of Psalms from creation to the giving of the law on Mount Sinai to the, the breaking of the law and, and the institution of the tabernacle and then of the temple. We, we see that in the book of Psalms. And then we see the, the exile as, as Israel disobeys, and we read about that in the history books, but then we see it also in the book of Psalms. Israel disobeys and God takes them away, but then as God brings them back, and there's songs about all of those events. And then to cap it all off, what Psalms does is it points us then, not, it doesn't just leave us there, it points us to a coming Messiah. Hey, here's one that is coming that one day, none of this, we won't have to worry about any of this anymore. And there's coming a Messiah. God is going to, to provide us with a, a perfect king who will rule and reign and finally set the world in order. All right? Number two, the Psalms then, just again, practical thoughts, the Psalms touch every possible human need. Every situation of life is covered in the book of Psalms. Um, they show us the, the dangers of life, right? Uh, they show us what we, what we should keep or what we should think about in our mind. They show us what attitude we should have toward the things of life, right? Should I go into life and, and be uh, defeated and uh, uh, just kind of, you know, unaware and, and uncertain and, and or should I go into life praising the Lord and keeping Him first and trusting Him that no matter what happens on the, in the external circumstances, He's still the Savior of my soul. He still has taken me out of the miry pit and He set my feet on a solid rock. I can still pray to Him, Lord, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. All right? Um, those are all passages right out of the Psalms. It's, it's, it's helping us to understand whatever human need you have, it's covered in the Psalms. There's, there's 
helpful thoughts there. there. There's helpful actions there, helpful attitudes for us to have as Christian people. How should I trust my Lord in times of struggle and doubt and, and disconcerting uh, uh, feelings? These psalms, they, they teach us how to talk to God. Um, do I have to include uh, 13 these and 12 thous and four our fathers in order to be heard by God? <laughs> no, no. Now some people pray that way, but I don't, that's not how I have to speak with him. Right? He's my heavenly father. I never spoke to my father like that. And by the way, this is just a, a free tidbit to throw in for nothing. All right? um, I try to be very careful even the words that I say, because if you'll listen to some people, and usually after I say something like this, people start laughing because either one, they pray like this, or they know somebody that prays like this. And they will say, for example, the word Lord in a two-minute prayer. They'll say the word Lord 57 times. Now, Lord, help us, Lord. And, and Lord, watch over us, Lord. And Well, I don't talk to anybody else like that. I need to talk to my Heavenly Father as my Heavenly Father. Now, is it wrong to say Lord? Not at all. That's what He ought to be in your life. But let's be thinking, instead of just saying religious words, let's be thinking about what we're saying. Right? Let, let's make our prayers... Um, here's a novel thought. Make your prayer real to your Heavenly Father. Pray like you're actually praying to Him. That would be a good thought, a good thing to do. Because as you read the Psalms, most of these are prayers. They're, they're, they're pouring their heart out to God. Lord, here's what's going on in my life. And I need your help. And I, I, I don't understand, but I want to trust you. So Lord, help me, strengthen me, protect me. Be my shield, be my buckler, be my strength when, when I don't have strength. All right? They, they help us. That what, what the Psalms do is they put the greatness of God in comparison with the weakness of us. <laughs> and they, they help us to, to make that correlation. Well, look at me. I'm in trouble all the time, it seems like. And I'm struggling with all these, these issues in my life, and it seems like I'm discouraged and, and nothing is going right. But my God is greater than all of those things. And so what Psalms does is it, it helps us to put my, st my struggles alongside God's greatness because our God never struggles. He never fails. He never has a problem. There's nothing that is a, a problem for Him. He never struggles with any of these things. And so what He says is, you're my child. I want to help you to not struggle through those things. He doesn't say, well, you ought to just buck up, soldier, and not feel that way. That's not what he says. He expects, in fact, that I'm going to feel that way. He made me, by the way. All right? He knows what my emotional state is and, and how different people handle different things and, and, and how things affect people differently. That's not a sinful thing. The problem becomes when I don't give those things to him. And I try to bear all that on my own. Or I try to go my way without God. Or, here's a good thought, I go to God and He gives me a solution or, or some attitude that needs to change. And I step back and look at it and I say, no, that, I don't think that's going to work. And what I do when I do that is I'm making myself either to be God myself or just as big as God is and saying, no, that's, that's not it. And what Psalms does is it helps us to see your God is a lot bigger than you. And He knows a lot more. And He loves you more than you could ever imagine. So you can trust Him with your life. It's just, it's, it's so practical in some of those things. I read this quote, Psalms is a medicine chest for the heart and the best possible guide for practical living. I think that's a good statement. Psalm is, is tremendous. Number three, the Psalms orientate our hearts to God. What the Psalms do is they take our need... And immediately again, they connect it to God's heart, to God's character, to God's intentions, to God's nature. Because I can, when, when I'm going through difficulty, I can quickly lose sight of all of those things. And I start to get real kind of tunnel vision about I'm the only one out here that's suffering. All right? Number four, 
And we'll try to hurry through these. Number four. The Psalms then, what they do, and we've kind of alluded to this, the Psalms then lead us to God. Right? They lead us to God. They lead us right to God's presence. As you read through most of these Psalms, you get a very distinct sense that whoever is writing this or praying this prayer or singing this song, believe that God could hear them and that He would answer what they're, what they're asking Him to do. Well, that's a good thing because that's how we ought to behave. That's how we ought to act. That's how we ought to pray. All right? Um, can I be open and honest to God? Yes. Yes. And so, uh, you ever get tempted to complain? <laughs> Uh, if you're honest, yeah, some of you self-righteous types, oh, no, never, never. No, we do. But what the Psalms help us understand is, I bring my complaint to God. I don't complain about God. Right? Bring your complaint to Him. Voice your frustrations to Him. Because what He does so often in the Psalms is as the psalmist brings their frustration to God, He begins working in their heart. Because they've come to Him. And so then you get to the end of the psalm and it's like, I'm just going to praise you because you're better. You're, you're, you're great. You, you, you can take care of this problem and it's not an issue for you. And so I'm just going to praise you. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. Instead of getting bitter and frustrated about it, take it to the Lord. Let Him change our minds about those things. All right? God understands every agony that, that we deal with in our hearts. He already knows everything that's going on in our heart and in our life. He doesn't expect me not to feel the emotions that I feel or, or feelings that I, I have. He doesn't expect me to, to repress my feelings about those things. Right? God never says, well, just buck up, soldier, and, and march on. He wants to deal with it. At the same time, he says, but still let's move forward. Right? Not just forget about it, but let's deal with it. Let's draw closer to me as we continue to go forward. I think oftentimes of uh, Israel in the wilderness and they're at the Red Sea. You remember that? They're at the Red Sea and they don't know what to do and the, the Egyptian army is breathing down their neck. And so uh, God is leading them to this point and if, you're, if you just think through, God is greater than whatever the Egyptian army can do and He's led them to this point. Don't you think He's going to take care of them? He did not lead them out in the wilderness to, to, to die. Though that's what they said. And so what do they do? They begin to pray and seek the Lord and say, Lord, what are you, why are you doing this? And his response is tremendous. Why are you praying? Go forward. We, we've dealt with this. I'm leading you in this direction. Now, don't, don't lose sight of the fact. Let's go forward. Go forward. Go forward. So again, don't misunderstand and think, well, I'm just supposed to you know, be, a, be a trooper for the Lord. You know, this is just something I have to deal with. No, God wants you to give that to Him. But with Him to go forward, to, to, to grow through that, right? Because you and I know the secular world that we deal with, that, that we live in, has its own way of handling emotions and difficulties and, and, and problems, all right? Uh, either they tell you to just vent it to whoever, <laughs> Well, that's a struggle because then you just get mad at somebody else and then you offend them and then you've hurt a relationship there. All right? Or it tells you to, to bury it deep inside and try to become stronger than the emotions that you're feeling or to numb yourself through drugs or alcohol or improper relationships or on and on and on and on and on. But what God wants you to do in most of these psalms is He's, he's begging us to express those things to Him. And then when I express those things to him and I give it to him, he says, and I'll give you the grace to go through it. I'll give you the strength that you need. And so time after time in the Psalms, that's what happens. And it's just, again, it's tremendous to read these things. Because the, the option that we have and what many people use today is a little thing called Facebook. Well, let me vent my frustrations on Facebook. Somebody made me mad, and so I'm going to, I won't say their name, but I'm going to hint around enough to where you know who it is, and we don't have to say their name, but everybody knows you need to just treat them like a bunch of dirt. Is that a good way to deal with things? No. You think that's what God wants me to do, is take my issues to Facebook? Well, I'm mad, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blurt this thing out. 
That's not what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to take that to my Lord. I'm supposed to let Him take care of those things. I'm supposed to leave that with Him and then experience the grace that He gives to me. Because God is saying time after time, come to me. Come to me. Go to the Lord before you go to your keyboard. That would be a good, good thing to do. Or you, where's my phone? I'm going to, man, I'm going to blister them. <laughs> or get your favorite text messaging app and just rip into, you know, just tell every friend that you have mutually what a rotten person the other person is. That's not the way to deal with that. Number five. The Psalms then allow us to see God as He is. Not as we wish Him to be, not as, as we, we want Him to be. We see Him as He really is. And when I see God as He really is, it ought to change my life. It ought to do something in me. Number six. Then the Psalms... This is great. The Psalms bring us to Jesus Christ. Do you know that in the New Testament, Jesus sung many of these Psalms? For example, when you go uh, to New Testament um, reading and you're reading through Jesus uh, having the Last Supper, he is, is giving them an example for what I believe to be uh, communion, uh, those kinds of services, that, that, that same thought. And so he is, is giving them uh, this, this time together with him before his crucifixion. And you remember what the Bible says? Af after they had supped, they sung a hymn. Well, that would be the, the songbook of Israel, so to speak, the Psalms. And so they're singing these Psalms of degrees as they make their way then up to the Mount of Olives, into the Garden of Gethsemane. Because Jesus knows what's about to take place. He sung many of these Psalms. Do you know that the, the, the one book that Jesus quotes the most in the New Testament is the book of Psalms? He quotes the book of Psalms more than any other book in, in the Bible as he preaches and teaches in the New Testament. And many of the Psalms, as you read through them, some of them are prophetic, as we mentioned that. Many of them describe his character. They, they describe the, the, the prophecy uh, about him. They all point to a relationship with him. Uh, look at Psalm, uh, let's see, Psalm 2. Verse 1, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. By the way, who's the anointed of the Lord? That's the Messiah. Saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens, you know, that, this is the reference in all the Bible where God laughs. Is he's laughing at their effort to try to come against him. It's never going to work. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Now, now look at the last uh, verse in the, the book. In fact, look at verse 11. Now look at verse 10. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judge of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Notice, kiss the sun. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Who's that talking about? Jesus Christ. And so all of, many of these psalms are just, they're leading us to Jesus Christ, pointing us to that coming Messiah. Just, it's tremendous what's there. Um, I had mentioned Psalm 73, and we don't have time necessarily to turn there, but if you get a time to read that tonight, I'd encourage you to read that. Psalm 73 and Psalm 77 are Psalms of Asaph. And it's Asaph looking at the world around him. And we'll preach through this here um, in some time, I know. But uh, he's looking at the world around him and the wicked are prospering and he's trying to serve the Lord and he's not doing it. Nothing seems to be going right for him. And so he tells the Lord, I'm tired of that. <laughs> I'm going to sit here and I'm going to whine about it. And Lord, you're not being right to me. And in Psalm 73, as you read specifically that psalm, he said, that was my mindset. And then he comes to a turning point in, the, in the, the psalm and he says, until I went to the house of the Lord. Until I got some perspective and I began to listen to God's word being preached and sung and, and began to spend time with other believers. And then God did a work in my heart and it changed my entire perspective. See, I didn't think about their end. I didn't think 
you know what? They might be prosper now, but if they continue going down this way, that's the road of destruction. And at the very least, if I have nothing else, I have the grandeur of heaven to look forward to. And it just, it changed his heart. And so that happens time after time, after time, after time. I won't go into the, the part about imprecatory psalms. There are uh, 14 imprecatory psalms, and all those are just, they're prayers for curses against the enemies. And sometimes, I, I wanted to, to just mention it, because sometimes skeptics of the Bible will turn to things like the imprecatory psalms and say, well, see here, didn't God say in the New Testament we're supposed to pray for our enemies and love those that despitefully use you and curse you, or whatever? Well, how come in the psalms it says, you know, Lord, strike them dead? <laughs> Isn't that contradictory? And so I just, I, again, I'm not going to go into it, so don't try to drag me into that. But save to say, what those psalms are doing is they're focusing more on God's justice and God winning the day rather than my own vengeance toward what I perceive to be enemies against me. I'm giving those things over to the Lord, all right, to let Him deal with them in a much better way than I ever would. All right. So um, we'll, we'll talk about that here maybe in another few weeks or so. Just kind of come back to that thought of imprecatory psalms. But I don't want to go any longer because I've already gone a little bit uh, over time tonight as, uh, as it is. So that's the book of Psalms. I wish we had about 10 weeks to go through the psalms, but we don't. So um, go through, read those psalms. Man, they're tremendous. And just... Praise the Lord for the, the songs and the, the help that he gives in that great book. Talk about a great book. And the next time we're together in this study, we're going to be in Proverbs. Wow. Wow, there's some wisdom in Proverbs. Next Wednesday night, be here. Got a missionary coming next Wednesday night. Church planner over in Texarkana, um, Brother Tyrone Barfield. Uh, he is doing a good job, and the Lord directed him to, to plant a church there. And uh, he's going to be with us. He's going to present and then preach. You won't want to miss it. He's an a interesting fella, just a, a neat guy. And uh, so you come next Wednesday night. We'll have a missionary church planner with us. And I think it's just, I want to put, continue to put before us, man, the issue of church planning and missions and all that, just to kind of keep it on the front burner so that we understand, hey, we're bigger than just us here in Austin, Texas. There's a whole world out there that we need to be concerned about and be praying for. So a um, couple of announcements. Grow Week. It's G Week for Grow. That's Saturday. Ladies' Luncheon. You can sign up at the back. And then music class begins this Sunday evening at 5 o'clock. And so if you're interested in doing that,